Greetings, Slashaholics, and welcome to another episode of After the Slash. Um, I do I do have uh, a couple of Texas Chainsaw things to say. Really oh. excited. Um, you know, I told you that if they, yeah, that, that's what made me think of that. Um, you know how if the studio doesn't make another entry into the franchise within a couple of years, they're going to lose the rights? Yeah. Um, I know they've been filming a new Texas Chainsaw with the producer being the guy who remade uh, Evil Dead, uh, Fede Alvarez, I think. Um, it's coming to Netflix next month. Oh, wow. They just released the trailer for it, and it does what a trailer should. It it showed flashes and sounds and clip. Like You don't even know what's going on in the trailer, but it looks really cool. It didn't show me half the goddamn pot. It's like yeah. somebody running, somebody's in a crawl space, and there's a saw coming through the floorboards chasing them, and then there's a shadow of Leatherface, and it's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Thank you for being subtle like a trailer should be. And when I saw that, you know how they came out with the Friday the 13th, the game? Uh, I mean, I know we, we talk about it a lot. They're doing a Texas Chainsaw yep. one. Same company. Did you see the trailer? It looks fantastic. Same company. And you can also play as other members of the Sawyer family. Not just... Um, huh? No, uh, speaking of that, speaking of the rest of the family, you know Bill Mosley that plays Chop Top? Yeah. I was watching an interview. Do you know how he got involved with Texas Chainsaw Massacre? By accident, he was sleeping in a truck yeah. or something. Um, it was really funny. He said that he was working, but he wanted to bulk up for a role. So he took a job on a farm in the Midwest. And there was this kid that would constantly eat junk food and candy. So he was constantly on a sugar high. And this kid would randomly just say stuff like, Captain Crunch. And it was like randomly say these jingles. But at one part, he was like, mm, the Texas Chainsaw Manicure. <laughs> Oh, my God. And Bill oh, Mosley was like, oh, my God, we're going to film that. So they filmed uh, a nightmare sequence where this woman falls asleep in a beauty salon and Leatherface runs out with a chainsaw and then, like, does her nails. Well, apparently somebody sent that to Tobey Hooper and Tobey Hooper was like, who is the guy that played the hitchhiker in that? And it was like, oh, Bill Mosley he helped make this movie. So he got him an audition. And he played Chop Top and the rest is history. And he came back for the, uh, what was it? He Texas played Chainsaw a, 3D. Yeah, he played uh, one of the characters from the first movie or something. Drayton. Yeah, that, that was pretty cool. I'm looking forward to that game. Um, you know, I saw the best movie I've seen in a long time. A movie that made me laugh, made me cry, made me cheer. It was the perfectly made formula. It was a sequel to a great movie from the 80s that I love, Ghostbusters Afterlife. That movie, I went and saw it. on the, I actually saw it the day before opening day where they had like the one showing preview. It was great. Uh, it's such a, an amazing homage to Harold Ramis, to the character of Egon, uh, just a love letter to the fans, and it's how a sequel should be made, and I'm excited to see where they go from here. But... Um, it blows the female reboot out of the water. Like, this was great. I wish that Bill Murray wouldn't have been so stuck up over the years and had done this movie when, when Harold was still with us. But the CGI effects and stuff for Harold, I don't want to give too much away if nobody's seen it yet. But it's the best I've ever seen. And it's got such a touching story, touching ending, action-packed, funny it was great the best movie i've seen in a long time um and it, another thing that was nostalgic for me that i got to see uh was i watched the i binge watched dexter new blood and i always hated the way dexter ended because it's like he just fakes his death goes into self-exile becomes a lumberjack and it was silly. It was stupid. You can tell they were just leaving it open uh, in case they wanted to revisit it. He never got outed with his co-workers. Nobody knew what he was. He didn't get arrested, blah, blah, blah. He always would find a way out of getting caught. New Blood, spoilers ahead right now. If you have not watched Dexter New Blood, skip ahead about a minute. I'm going to give you three seconds, and then I'm going into spoilers. So one, two, 
three. In New Blood, uh, he hasn't killed in 10 years. He is dating a sheriff in a small town in uh, upstate New York. Uh, he's under an assumed name of Jim Lindsay, which is a reference to the author of the books, Jeff Lindsay. And his son Harrison, teenage son, shows up and everything changes. He tries to become a dad for Harrison. He explains to him the best he can why he went away. Uh, you get a really cool flashback to when Rita was killed in the original series by the Trinity Killer. John Lithgow came back to do like a 30-second cameo, uh, and you find out that Harrison does remember seeing his mom get killed, and you get to see a scene where John Lithgow gets out of the tub after killing Rita, picks up baby Harrison, and says, now, now, it's okay, daddy will be home soon. And it's just so chilling and creepy. And... Uh, Harrison, it looks like he has a dark passenger too. Like he's got, he was born in blood like his dad. He's got all this anger and everything. And eventually um, Dexter lets him in on what he is, a serial killer in the code of Harry. Uh, there's a new killer in the series that becomes the villain, and that is Clancy Brown, who is an amazing actor. Um, I always remember him as the guard from Shawshank who like fucking beat, the, beat that one guy to death. Exactly. Another. He's all. He's always good in everything he does. He's good in the show Carnival too. Um, and there's a new anthology horror movie on Shutter, where he's kind of the the host of it. I cannot think of the name right now, but look up Clancy Brown Shutter. It's an it's a horror anthology. Great movie. Um, but anyways, Harrison gets to be there for a kill, and he learns the code and everything, but the sheriff starts putting some pieces together. Uh, Dexter messed up. Anyways, long story short, she figures out that he is the Bay Harbor Butcher all the way from Miami. Uh, she even calls Batista and lets him know that Dexter's alive. And in the same moment of finding out that Dexter's alive, he's also told uh, you know, he's the Bay Harbor Butcher. I have the proof. I've got him in jail. Dexter gets arrested in the show in the, towards the end, gets arrested and charged for being the Bay Harbor Butcher. And the guy that plays Batista does this amazing thing with his face. Like when he finds out Dexter's alive, it's like happiness that his friend's not dead. Then it's kind of confusion. And then it's betrayal. When he realizes that, you know, Dexter's the Bay Harbor Butcher, that uh, if it wasn't for Dexter, his wife, Maria LaGuerta, would still be alive. Uh, Dokes would still be alive. And uh, Surprise, motherfucker. Yeah, I don't want to give away how it actually ends, but I will tell you this. Dexter, there's no way Dexter can come back unless they uh, pull kind of a... Harrison story where Harrison kind of like Dexter always saw his dad as his his dark passenger uh, during this season it, you don't see Harry at all uh, Deborah is Dexter's dark passenger for the season uh, so she came back uh, she died in the original series uh, but anyways I don't want to give away exactly how the season ends but it was perfect it felt like it felt like a really good season, like the first four seasons of Dexter. And the ending brought a tear to my eye. It was really beautiful and uh, a good ending. It's a very divisive ending. A lot of people are mad. I think mostly because they just didn't want it to end more so than the execution of how it ended. But people are always going to bitch and complain. You know, that's just that's just how it is. Uh, but that was really good. And the last thing I wanted to bring up and discuss with you, uh, you said you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either, but we're going to do some spoilers for Scream 5. So, again, if you, don't, if you haven't seen it, you know, just a heads up, spoilers are coming. Sean, you know that I've been against, I've said Scream 5 is redundant for months now. Uh, Scream 4 was redundant. I always said the only way... Scream 4 another... killed... The franchise for me, I, I couldn't watch anymore. It's like, what's the point? 
you're just going to keep bringing shit out of the woodwork and, and shoehorning it in. I thought if they were going to make a Scream 5, the only thing that made sense was to either kill Sydney or make it where after all these all this trauma she's been through, she's the one that snaps and ends up killing, you know. And I'm guessing <laughs> that's not what happens in the fifth one? No, we're, we're going to get to that, but... I thought it would have been cool, like, if they had done, like, a whole throwback to Randy and how he said the light, what was going on was, like, horror movies, trilogy roles and all that. And I could see her snapping at the end, you know, revealing she's the killer and saying, you know, Randy was right. It's it's a movie. And the only way to keep it from being rebooted and, and to, from keeping going is to just kill off all the main characters. I, I'm doing this mm. to help you, you know, but. I know who the killer is. If we're going off of Friday the 13th. Part five, it's the ambulance driver. <laughs> you ain't going to believe. Who Point spoiler from 1986. Some random character from the first Scream that didn't even have a big role is the killer. And it's so stupid. Uh, then the main girl besides Sydney ends up being the daughter of... Loomis, the original ghost face. Not Stu, but Sydney's boyfriend from the first movie apparently cheated on her and had a kid and the main girl is his kid and she literally says towards the end of the movie, you don't fuck with the daughter of a serial killer. That is so cringy and so stupid. When has anyone ever said that? But here's the worst part. I, I did say... One of the things that would be cool for a fifth movie is if they killed one of the top three characters, but only in the cold open. Every screen movie starts with a kill scene. You know what I mean? Like Drew Barrymore's the first one, then the movie theater in the second one, and so on. And I said in this one, if they're going to make a screen five, kill Gail or Dewey or Sydney. Do it in the, but do it in the cold open. Nope. In the cold open for this movie, there's not even a kill. The person gets away in the cold open. So they have, they've are it's like it's like they ruined it. That scream is supposed to start that way. And then Dewey has always been my favorite character because that dude has been there for Sydney, everybody. He's been stabbed multiple times. He always pulled through. And I felt like if any of the characters needed a happy ending, it was him. And if they were going to kill somebody, Gail Weathers made the most sense to me. Because at this point, uh, apparently she's like a big time uh, news anchor on TV, like a CNN type news anchor. Uh, She's really doing good for herself. Dewey has moved back to Springwood. I said Springwood. Uh, Whatever the fuck the name of the town is, I can't remember. Um, And he was the sheriff there, and he's just kind of gone crazy. Anyways... Scene in the movie, he saves everybody, gets them out of an area where Ghostface is, shoots Ghostface like nine times. And then as he's getting everybody to safety, he says, oh, I got it. I can't forget the rule from Randy, headshot. So he goes back to do the headshot. The killer was wearing a bulletproof vest, apparently, and Dewey gets eviscerated, gets gutted, knife in the... Stabbed multiple times, the knife, you know, they killed Dewey. They didn't do it. If they had done it in the cold open, that would have made sense to me. That would have been like, that would have got, would have moved the plot forward. You know, Sydney's like, no, I'm taking, I'm taking whoever it is down. They took, they killed Dewey. But instead they made him do something so fucking stupid and then killed him. And the killer tells him as he's killing him, it's such an honor to kill you. It's just so cringy. So they, poor David Arquette, man. That's all he had to look forward to was future sequels to get roles. But no, Dewey. I don't think. I think it should have been Gail. So like, all these things. I already didn't want to see the movie, and now I'm glad I didn't pay for a ticket. Uh, what are your I'm thoughts? I'm glad too. Shit, I was thinking about watching it because I'm like, oh, it's gonna have a lot of ties to the first one. That that all sounds terrible. You don't fuck with the. Daughter of a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, if we're talking about sequels, 
I just saw Halloween Kills. Okay. I've heard nothing but bad shit about this movie for months. Everyone's like, oh, they flew too close to the sun, and I didn't like this, I didn't like that, and no one would give me specifics. No one would be like, I didn't like how this was executed. Someone wasn't like, oh, I don't like how this character died. No, uh, everyone was like, this is bad. Why is it I bad? This is horrible. It. I have not seen it, but I've had some major points spoiled. So go ahead and say whatever you want. But spoiler warning, if you haven't seen it, I'm waiting until Halloween Ends comes out and I'm going to watch all three. But I already know the big kill of part two. Uh, but go ahead. Well... I'm going to say what I liked about it. The score, John Carpenter, I did not think it was possible for him to come out with a better musical score. I love the 2018 soundtrack. I love this one even more. This one does a lot of flashbacks to what happened after 1978 when he fell off the balcony. Yeah, I thought it was just going to be like a five-minute clip. This goes on for like 20 minutes, and I got so into it. I was really – because they, they, they lay breadcrumbs. That's That's not the word I want to use. <laughs> they they lay down stuff that's going to happen in movie three in 1978. So when it jumps back to 2018, because it's the same night from the old, the last one, you understand certain characters better. They have mo- motivations that you weren't aware of yet that's going to trickle in. Certain people were alive that you thought were going to die. Some people died that you thought were going to stay alive. And they do more with the mythos of Michael. Like, if the, if the last one was Michael killing again, this one is the effect he's having on the town. And oh, That's something they haven't really touched on. Because, you know, I know they've done a mob hunting Michael Myers. They did that in the fourth one. But the yeah. psychological damage these people have been dealing with for 40 years, it really delves into that. So when, you know, because they're not aware Michael's back. They don't know. They're in a bar. They're at parties. They don't know Michael's escape until they see the TV footage, and they're like, "God damn it!" Like, and they 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 just lose their fucking mind. And when you see all the scenes with them, that none of them have had closure. None of them have gotten over the horrors of 1978. Friends yeah. died. Uh, people witnessed Michael. People wit people who ran into Michael that you didn't even know about. That is what the flashback is about. So there's even more people who are traumatized because of 1978. And to me, that was really intriguing because I, I think if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have understood why these people are so insane when they find out Michael escaped. Um, and when you get to the end of the movie, it really solidifies what Michael is, and it's not what you really think he is. It kind of goes like a like never hike alone. I yeah. felt like th- Michael was kind of turning into Jason from that. Okay. And I really uh, love the cinematography, the acting, the visuals, the music. Like, when this movie ends, I'm pumped up for the next one. But the ending was weird because the theatrical is not the extended one. And what happened was, I, I guess the theatrical ended a little ambiguously. The extended cut has a scene that's going to be weird because apparently Halloween ends is going to take place four years later. Okay. And when the theatrical cut ended, okay, it's going to go into that one. But the extended cut makes it seem like you're going to have a Michael encounter like the, the that same hour. But that's not going to make... Well, to me, it, it's going to be fine if they can't find Michael. Then, of course, it's just, you know, it doesn't matter how much you want to fight somebody and you're going off screen, if you can't find them, then it's going to be four years later. I actually like the extended cut. Uh, When I got done with it, I mean, stay after the credits. There's a really cool song in the credits by a band I didn't even know about. And, like, everything about this movie was great. The the visuals, the music, the lighting. I mean, I just, I I was halfway through this movie, and I couldn't understand why everyone just kept saying, it's the worst Halloween ever. Really? Will Lori make it, you think, to the very end? Will she survive? Oh, oh, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, there is one thing you brought up multiple times about something you don't like about Halloween 2018. It gets fixed in this movie. Oh, so they are. I'll I'll say that right now because it it might make you want to see this. You know how you said you didn't understand why Michael was going after Lori because they don't have the brother-sister aspect? Yeah. They explain that because Lori goes, 
he's after me. And some guy goes, he's not after you. Michael didn't even know where you were. Sartain gave him a map. We found that at the crime scene. Sartain drove him to your compound. Michael could not get to his next place. Like, Michael's path home had to go through your compound. Like, his kills are a beeline to his home. Sartain set the dominoes to fall. Michael, if he had not been brought there in that cop car, Michael never would have passed by your place. So Michael's not hunting you. He's going home. And I'm like, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I still wish that they had kept the brother-sister angle. I know. I, just, I, thought, that, I thought it was cool how they fixed that. I, I, do, I do like that. At least now it's, it's not him hunting her. You know, that makes a lot, that, that really makes a lot more sense for me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Big spoiler, don't listen if you haven't seen Halloween uh, Kills. How sho- I haven't seen it yet, but how shocking was it to see uh, Lori Strode's daughter get killed? To me, it didn't make a lot of sense because I, I, don't, I don't know what she was doing in the first place. It's like a window or something, right? Yeah, but she's outside. She's part of the mob that kills Michael. And then she walks by and she sees a silhouette of Michael as a kid in the window. And she goes to check. And then Michael's behind her and kills her. Like it makes no it, it makes no sense why she would even go into that house again. There's How no goddamn the- reason she should have gone into that house again. It's it's Michael's house. He already butchered a shit ton of people. He almost killed her daughter in that house. And she still goes into that house and dies by Michael. It, like, there's no re- this. She was so ditzy in this movie. Like, it would, it just, I don't understand how she could have gone through all that combat training, literally went up against Michael in 2018, and then in this movie, she's like, um, she's just so nonchalant about Michael in this movie, and I just, it makes no sense for her character arc. How did she survive? Uh, or, I mean, how did Michael survive being killed by the mob, though? I don't get that. They even say, it's not really explained. That's why I wasn't mad, because there's going to be a third one. This is a trilogy, and it's going to lead into a third. If this was the end one, I would have been really pissed, because there's no explanation. But a lot of stuff I was pissed about in 2018, they explained in this movie. So I'm hoping it's going to be explained in the next one. So I'm not mad. I'm, I'm putting a tab in it. We'll address it later. Because like you said, the whole Laurie aspect thing was explained in this one. So... I'm not going to complain about it because Danny McBride did, like, make a trilogy, and we haven't gotten there yet. I do hope that Lori survives the entire thing and that Michael's death is definitive. It's not something that can be rewritten to where it was just a paramedic, you know, wearing the mask. Because that, that, never, that never made any sense to me. Because, like, even if the dude couldn't talk, why would he attack her, you know? Why not just stay back in the back and, uh, 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 you know, like time out, time out. Yeah. You know, like point at the mask, <laughs> something. I don't know. But, My but, name is and then just like signs of the name or something. Uh, but yeah, but, we actually riffed on that on Halloween revelations for, for the Halloween slash tracks. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun. We kept making jokes about how short he was. <laughs> um, he was so little in that. Michael Myers was so tiny in that one. But no, I hope that Lori doesn't die. I, I feel like her character does not need to die. There's no reason to kill her off. I think that the, the conclusion of Halloween Kills should be, if she does die, it needs to be at the same moment and the same cause of death as Michael. So both their stories are ended and it needs to be definitive where there's no chance of another sequel coming out to to cheapen how he's killed. It it should really be ended. I think it's time to end that franchise. And I think it's time to bring back Jason, especially now that the lawsuit's over. It's time for a 13th Friday the 13th. I don't know why nobody has capitalized on the 13th Jason yet. Uh, it's I, just perfect. They, there was a script floating around, and I really hope it does not become a movie because it was way too convoluted. What, what gets me is that I feel like there's a pressure to make it more 
special than everything else, but they end up throwing way too much into one movie, and you're like, you can be special without overdoing it. Like, the script was going to have, like, Jason's dad killing, then it was going to have Jason's mom killing, then it was going to have Jason killing. It was basically going to be, like, what's happening on the other side of, like, the first five Friday right the 13th. And I'm like, that's, that's too much. It's, it's Friday the 13th. Like, the, the remake of Halloween can't even say remake the the sequel to the original it kind of went back to its roots and i feel like that's what we need to do but i don't know i like the remake because i can look at it as a sequel instead of a remake to where jason's just been alone for so many years that he's regenerated back to almost human again that's the way i like to like to watch the remake instead of seeing it as a different universe jason i see it as the same jason from all of them, up to Jason Goes to Hell and everything, and Freddy versus Jason. But he went home. He's been there for a few years. The townsfolk have learned to leave him alone. And since he regenerates, he's regenerated back to almost human, lost his mask, went back to a sack. You know, that's how that's how I do it, just for fun. But if they're going to make another movie, I would rather them ignore the remake and pick it bring up. Bring Kane after, Hodder back. Yeah, bring Kane Hodder back if he's willing to do it. And make the movie pick up after the events of Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, uh, or after the events of Jason goes to hell and bring him back from hell some other way. But, you know, put some more mythology in there. Don't just give us a rehash of Jason killing people at a summer camp. Come up with something new, original. Yeah, Ooh, yeah, we can. I got Jason. something new and original. Okay, bear with me. Jason on a cruise ship. No, I'm no, this is like a really radical idea, okay? okay. So we're gonna take Jason. Now the whole thing is like he's at a he's at summer camps and he's trying to scare people. So in the future, he's gonna like be cryogenically frozen or something, and they're gonna like put him on a spaceship, he's gonna get turned into a cyborg, right? And then he's gonna get put on this like camp for delinquent teenagers and then they're gonna bring his mom back and then they're gonna bring him back and they're gonna fight on a dock and there's gonna be a robot dog and then there's gonna be a nazi i mean it's gonna be fucking awesome i think i'm gonna call it i think i'm gonna call it jason x death moon i mean can you imagine how fucking awesome that would be can we throw in some some like sex stuff with betty boop and elsa lancaster we're gonna make it even better we're gonna have him kill futuristic ray charles man Got it. Okay. Sold. I'm sold. I'm sold. I do like your idea of uh, the wall being built around Crystal Lake and stuff and a team sent in to take out Jason. That would be a good sequel. No, 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 no. That one, that one was going to be about they know that anyone who goes in that camp dies, so they were going to build a wall around the camp. And to get rid of dissidents, they were just going to toss people into the camp, like throwing people into a shark tank. And it was going to be about like, somebody who was a political prisoner thrown in there by like a fascist government and their friends and family are going to go into the camp knowing they risk death to try to get their friend out. Like yeah, the government knows cool. about Jason. They're not going to hunt him. They're literally just going to throw people into the wall area. Kind of like Arkham city, Batman. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, I actually like, like that. I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired of reading these books about the military going to kill Jason. Let him let like, how about a book where they just leave him alive and throw people into his camp, like, specifically to die. Yeah, that could be the death sentence, you know, for uh, whatever state they want to put it in. Like, like it could be like Crystal Lake City or something, like Arkham City. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, uh, was there any other topics you wanted to touch on tonight? I really haven't watched many movies lately. I'm so wrapped up with school and work that... I mean, I've, I've wanted to watch Halloween Kills for months, and it just, you know, I, I waited. I didn't get to see it in theaters, and then I was waiting for it to come on DVD, and then it did come on a DVD, and I was still too busy, and I finally saw it this weekend. I was really happy with it, and um, right now I'm just really, really excited for the new Texas Chainsaw on Netflix. I saw the trailer. It looks fantastic. I I, I absolutely detested the last one they came out with. I, the Matthew McConaughey one was a lot better than the last one they came I out like with. I like that one. I like the new generation. I, I never had a problem with that movie. And I like the remake. I didn't like the prequel to the remake, but I like the remake. Um, oh, you, and, you, you'll, they actually said for this one coming to Netflix, they're like, y'all be excited. We got Kim Henkel to help write it, and he wrote the original. And I'm like, y'all fail to mention 
he directed the fourth one, which was so bad, they rebooted it with Michael Bay. <laughs> That's not something you should be advertising as, like, your crowning achievement. We got the original writer. <laughs> Shit. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not something that would just be like... Good. What? Other than people using cell phones that didn't exist for the time period, was the Adam Marcus one pretty good? I loved it. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, there were some things I would have changed, but I really, really enjoyed it. Apparently it was supposed to be set in the 90s, and then someone fucked up and put a cell phone in it, and they couldn't get a lot of the costumes from the 90s because it was expensive, and you know, it, it it came out in the late 2000s, but it was supposed to be like 1995. So I take it with a grain of salt. Okay, the ages make sense. It's fun for what it is. I would have liked to have seen some of the family members alive, not dead. But yeah. I don't know. I like the 2013 one. I mean, I've watched it more than more than once. Sophia likes it because it's kind of like a murder mystery a little bit. And, you know, I don't know. It's fun. Wish well, I had the soundtrack. I can't find that. I'm going to try to reach out to a couple actors from the remake from 01 and uh, the author of the novelization, Stephen Hand, and see if we can get somebody on the next episode of Out of Print Slashers to discuss it with us since we're going to be talking about the novelization of the remake. Ah, you'll get Jessica Biel. <laughs> yeah, I see that happening. <laughs> yeah. but, like, I, I don't know. I wrote her a letter and she answered, so <laughs> she is. I uh, never saw that coming, but you, know, you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. But yes, that, that'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that to that too. I would love to give you my voodoo password so you could watch Ghostbusters Afterlife because I'd love to take on it. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't appreciate it. I only saw the first one. and you know, it's it didn't... Also, it's a, the, it, 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 That's the movie that it's an homage to. It There's so much that ties to the first movie. It's, it's beautiful. But uh, they, they don't really reference the second movie. But it, it, it is canon. Like, I think there's a couple little references. But the movie has to do with Gozer, uh, the guy that built uh, the, the building in New York, built a, uh, pretty much a portal in this little small town in Oklahoma to bring Gozer back uh, again. And Egon had left the Ghostbusters and been staying there for years keeping Gozer from escaping. And uh, he gets killed. Uh, I don't want to ruin it, because I think one day you should watch it, and you may enjoy it. If you've seen the first one, you'll really understand this one. And they it was it was really, really well done. Uh, I want to let all the patrons know, I really appreciate you supporting the channel. Uh, keep an eye out. The next uh, couple chapters of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror Fatal Games We'll be hitting Patreon very soon. You'll get access to that for about a week or two before it hits YouTube. Um, be sure to check out Slash Tracks News. Uh, it's a new podcast on the channel. Funny stuff. Uh, the latest episode of Slash Tracks is out. We riffed on Hellraiser Revelations. Uh, we're going to bring Sean in to riff with us on a future episode. Uh, pick out a movie and we'll get that going. And... Uh, there's a review show coming, Slash Tracks Reviews. Got a cool theme song written, new animation coming. And uh, we're working on a show called Hashing the Slash, where Sean Campbell, me, Slasher Pepper, and Alex Vanover, and maybe a guest every episode, uh, two of us will pick one side of a horror topic, two of us will pick the other, and we will debate it out. It's going to get nasty, but uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, thank you all so much for supporting the channel. I love each and every one of you. Be excellent to each other, and I'll see you very soon. Say goodnight, Sean. Night. Sean. <laughs>